Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Aninda Minocha, and I'm, today I'm going to be presenting on behalf of the Decades team our work on hardware software co-design for efficient graph application computations on emerging architectures. Uh, I'm going to give a brief overview of what the Decades project is. So Decades is part of the DARPA software-defined hardware program, which aims to design runtime reconfigurable hardware that can accelerate a variety of data-intensive software applications in the broad domains of machine learning and graph analytics. So the Decades approach is to design a heterogeneous tile-based chip that is a combination of core, accelerator, and intelligent storage tiles, as you can see on this image on the right. And this is a collaborative effort uh, between researchers at Princeton and Columbia University. So all of our tools are, or will be in the very near future, open source at this link below. So many machine learning and data science applications need to process large amounts of dense data in the, uh, for example, images composed of many pixels. Um, fortunately, huge strides have been made in processing this ty these types of data, like neural network accelerators. Meanwhile, graphs can efficiently represent big data, although their data layouts are often sparse, and so they require different computing paradigms. Due to the ubiquity of graph databases and data structures, graph applications are at the heart of many big data analytics, as you all know. Um, for example, recommendation systems. Uh, here's an example of Twitter's use of a recommendation system. So if a user goes to Fosdem's Twitter page, they will be recommended other free and open source software. <laughs> so in order to process um, big data, modern technology trends have employed uh, specialized hardware, which has led to accelerator-oriented heterogeneity and parallelism. As you can see in the graph, uh, the purple, black, and orange lines show the trends um, with these performance over time. And these have significantly benefited compute-bound workloads. But as you can see by the green line, there's a gap between processor and memory performance. And in the context of Amdahl's law, as compute is growing faster, the, access, the relative uh, memory access time is only growing slower. Uh, unfortunately, many graph applications are memory-bound. And furthermore, these graph applications need to process data sets that are massive and continuing to grow exponentially. So like the Twitter network contains millions of nodes. And the pro ability to process these networks hasn't kept up. So we need efficient graph processing techniques that can keep up with our modern data sets. So in order to design efficient graph processing techniques, we need to understand their bottlenecks. And because many graph applications are memory bound, we look at their data access patterns. So um, as you saw in the last presentation, we were introduced to the idea of a frontier. So we look at many graph applications that are front iterative and frontier-based. And this includes the widespread breadth-first search, single source shortest paths, and page rank algorithms. So what does it mean to be iterative frontier-based? Well, like we saw, we have a frontier of nodes. Um, we have multiple iterations to traverse the graph. And within each iteration of the graph, or iteration of the algorithm, we have a frontier of nodes that contains the IDs we want to process. And then we also have this flat array node vals which stores the per node properties. So depending on the objective of the algorithm, we store a different type of data for each node. So in breadth first search, this would be the number of hops away from our given source node. And then on the right, we have the kernel template for these iterative uh, frontier-based graph applications. So I'm going to walk through this template uh, in the context of the breadth first search algorithm. So we're starting with our root node of 0. And so for every node in our frontier, we do a processing of that node, and then we look at all of those no uh, all of that node's neighbors. And so, uh, in this case, we well we do an update of uh, an update neighbor function on that uh, neighbor, and the exact details of this function depend on the objective of the algorithm. In the case of breadth first search, we do a load to the node vals array in order to determine if the node has been visited, and if it has not been visited, then we need to store the number of hops away that um, node is from our given source node. And so because these updates depend on the location of these neighbors, these updates uh, need an indirect memory access. And this leads to, as you can see in this flat array, uh, this leads to irregular accesses within this array. Uh, so this is going to be the key thing to think <coughs> about uh, going forward. And then looking at the nodes that have not been visited, 
we add those to the frontier for the next iteration of the algorithm. And then this process continues until we reach an iteration where our frontier is empty. So why are irregular memory accesses problematic? Well, modern memory hierarchies um, are composed of multiple caches, and caches are designed to store um, frequently accessed data that is stored in contiguous blocks. So when your memory accesses are irregular, caches are not amenable to these accesses. And you can see this is highlighted by um, this sample memory hierarchy below. As we have to traverse the memory hierarchy and as we miss in each level of the cache, we eventually go off chip to main memory. And so uh, if you recall in the previous uh, kernel based uh, in the kernel template, the update neighbors function that performed the irregular memory accesses was inside a nested loop. And so it occurred very frequently. And so we define irregular memory accesses that occur frequently as llamas. Uh, this is our acronym for them. And so to quantify why llamas are problematic, we look at five different graph and sparse applications and break down their runtimes uh, into compute versus memory. So all of the compute is highlighted by the orange bars, and the memory accesses are broken into the llamas versus our non-llamas in the yellow. And as you can see, the llamas are dominating the runtime for all of these applications. This graph below shows specifically the llama's last level cache miss rate. So if you look at all of these five different applications, you can see that the last level cache miss rate is 0.5 or above, which means that 50, more than 50% of the time, these llamas are performing an expensive long latency memory access to main memory. So because llamas have a disproportionately large impact on the performance of these graph applications, our work seeks to specifically address them. And thus, we introduce our approach, fast llamas. So fast llamas is another acronym, short for full stack approach and specialization techniques for hiding long latency memory accesses. So this, uh, at a high level, is a data supply approach that efficiently maps uh, graph applications onto pairs of producer and consumer cores. And we have a programming model that can allow for more explicit mapping of these applications, as well as specialized hardware support that can asynchronously issue irregular memory accesses. And we do get results, uh, impressive speed ups from this, and I will show those at the end. Uh, first, I'm going to give a brief overview of the decoupling technique. So decoupling is, the te is a technique where a program is statically divided into two independent instruction streams. One of these streams is mapped onto a producer core. And this core is responsible for all memory accesses and the necessary address computation um, for these accesses. And then the consumer core is responsible for all the value computation. So these cores run independently and in parallel. And so this creates a form of heterogeneous parallelism. Uh, to, uh, to illustrate the contrast, these two execution timelines below show, on the left, homogeneous parallelism, where the two threads, the top and the bottom rows, are performing the same types of computation and memory access, whereas when you have heterogeneous parallelism, one thread is responsible for the memory accesses, this is the producer core, and then the other thread is doing the, com the computation. Uh, so homogeneous parallelism is great when you have a very compute-bound application, whereas when you have a memory-bound application, heterogeneous parallelism comes into play. So the main idea of decoupling is to tolerate memory latency. And this is done by having the producer issue requests to the memory hierarchy and retrieving the data before the, the consumer needs it. And so these cores utilize a specialized hardware, uh, the communication queue, in order to have the producer store the data before the, the consumer needs to eat this data. And um, this timeline on the bottom right that I pointed to earlier just illustrates how this can tolerate memory latency. So there's a warm-up period where these two cores start running at the same time, so the producer needs to gather its run ahead, but it does this very quickly. And once it's done this, then once the, pr the producer can asynchronously issue memory accesses, and the consumer then never has to stall. Whereas typically, these, uh, long la these memory accesses would be long latency, and the consumer would have to wait, waiting for this data. Because decoupling creates two different um, instruction streams that are independent, 
the, de the original dependencies in the program are now um, changed and remapped so that dependencies are only respective to the individual slices. So there might be a dependency on the producer's memory access, but now this could be mapped onto the consumer. And so when this does happen, we take advantage of this with asynchronous accesses. So asynchronous accesses are memory accesses where the data is not later used by the producer. So this is where the producer can hand it off to the consumer and move on to issue its other memory, its later memory accesses. And so as a result, it doesn't have to occupy its hardware structures or its pipeline resources. And this is illustrated on the right where we have two different execution timelines. The top one shows the scenario where there are no asynchronous memory accesses. So as you can see that each memory access the producer needs to issue depends on the previous one. And this leads to frequent stalling both on the producer and the consumer. Whereas when we have asynchronous memory accesses, the producer can issue a request and move on to its next one without having to wait for the previous one to finish. And following, oops, sorry. Um, following this warm-up period, the consumer never has to stall as a result. So now I'm going to talk about how Fast Llamas leverages this decoupling technique to uh, tolerate latency. Um, so to illustrate or to provide a contrast, um, this is the original uh, kernel for the iterative, graph, uh, iterative frontier based graph applications. Um, this is broken down into three high-level functions. The process node, which is highlighted by the orange boxes, and then we have the update neighbors, which is our llama, and this is highlighted by the red boxes. And then the conditional, up, uh, conditional addition of nodes to the frontier is highlighted by the blue boxes. And so when we execute uh, this template on an in-order core, we can see that the llamas are dominating the runtime. But Fast Llamas decouples this program so that the process node function um, is mapped onto the producer. So in this execution timeline on the lower left, we have the producer is the top row, and the consumer is the bottom row. And then the middle row, this uh, wide row, shows what's happening asynchronously in the memory hierarchy. So this isn't mapped onto a core. The producer and the consumer are the two cores running in parallel. And so the producer does the node processing, and then it can issue llamas. Um, this is shown by the small boxes with the init written on them. So it can issue a irregular memory access, and then continue to issue on its next one. And these are not time-consuming operations. And then the llamas are uh, issued or running asynchronously in the memory hierarchy. And then when their data comes back, the consumer can eat the data and continue on with its respective functions. So there's a warm-up period, again, where the producer needs to gain its initial run-ahead, but then it can continue from there, and the llamas are asynchronously issued after this warm-up period, and as a result, the consumer is never stalling waiting for these llamas, and fast llamas is able to tolerate memory latency. So this is a, this is a relatively detailed hardware diagram. I'm not going to talk about all of the individual parts of it, but I'm going to go over the main additions that Fast Llamas uses to support this in hardware. So we have an, a specialized buffer called the asynchronous access buffer. And so this is, when, this is used when the producer issues a memory access. And then this asynchronous access buffer can store the addresses um, of the in-flight memory requests. And then when the data comes back from the memory hierarchy, then these, uh, this data is matched with its corresponding address, and then the data is passed to the communication queue between the producer and consumer cores, and then the consumer can use this data. So when we have an asynchronous memory access, it's issued um, by the producer, sent to the memory hierarchy, its address is tracked, like I mentioned, and then when the data comes back, sometimes the data might be modified, um, and this can be sent directly to the memory hierarchy or onto the queue, the communication queue. So now I'm going to show um, some results of this approach. We looked at five different graph and sparse applications. These are the five that I mentioned before um, with the llama graphs. 
So we have two applications on top. Element-wise sparse dense is a matrix multiplication between a sparse matrix and a dense matrix. And then we have bipartite graph projections, which are which is an algorithm that operates on a bipartite graph and it relates nodes in one graph based off of their common neighbors in the other one. And then we have a vertex programmable graph processing algorithm. So we use three of the most widespread uh, algorithms, breadth first search, single source shortest paths, and page rank. And the difference between these algorithms and the two above are that these algorithms require an explicit annotation by the programmer. So our programming model supports an uh, annotation that allows the programmer to explicitly guide mapping. Um, so it can tell the compiler that performs our decoupling to map and memory access onto the consumer. And then the, t the top two applications do not, uh, they can automatically be sliced with our compiler. So going back to the decades hardware, we have the notion of core tiles. And so these core tiles can be reconfigured. So we can have them in t as two parallel core tiles that run uh, simultaneously, or we could have a fast llamas pair, which is a producer core tile and a consumer core tile. And so we evaluate both of these configurations. When we compare these two, we can see that uh, highlighted by the blue and the yellow bars in this graph, um, which this graph shows the geomean of um, each of these five applications. So we, run, we ran these applications on multiple different types of data sets, a combination of real and synthetic networks, but we're just showing their geomeans here. And looking at the geomeans, we can see that fast llamas uh, outperforms traditional parallelism by up to 2.7 <coughs> times. And then because graph applications are memory bound, we look at an in-order core with the perfect cache because this provides a performance idealization as if every memory access had only latency of one cycle. And so we can see that looking across the board at the orange and yellow bars, uh, fast llamas is uh, able to achieve up to 96.2% of perfect cache performance. And then looking at fast llamas compared to our baseline performance, which is that of a single in-order core tile, uh, we see up to a 5.32x performance improvement here. But when we looked at individual application input combinations, we saw up to an 8.66x speed up. So uh, this work was supported by DARPA, as I mentioned before. And so in conclusion, Fast Llamas is, hardware so is a hardware software co-design approach that tolerates latency on graph applications with um, its programming model, its compiler that can perform the automatic slicing into producer-consumer pairs, and the, the specialized hardware support for asynchronous memory accesses. Um, our team members, uh, so decades is a large effort between Princeton and Columbia, so our team members are listed here. And then you can access our applications, our compiler, and the simulator we use to get these performance results um, at these links below. And this is also being implemented um, to be designed on our chip, so the RTL is in progress, but that will be available soon as well. Um, that's it. Um, so the question was, can this architecture be or mitigate latency in uh, depth first search and strongly connected components? Um, so this uh, will we'll see the most impressive speed ups when you have these llamas, these like long latency memory accesses domi dominating the performance. Um, this could be, I guess it depends on the implementation of the algorithm, but we study the most work efficient ones where the long latency memory accesses are exposed. So I think in depth first search, the Long latency interfaces are not as much of a problem there, but um, it could work. Uh, 
Um, so I think you're asking about cases where the consumer needs. I, I, I mean, the, uh, because based on my understanding, generally now European will have a minimum of five years Oh, so are you asking if there's like a limited window which the decoupling can apply? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, okay, so the when we do the decoupling, the compiler, so the program is sliced, so the compile the producer has it, it sees its list of uh, memory accesses to um, issue when and in, uh, so this is where the programming model actually comes in. So we have an annotation in our programming model that can map or tell the compiler to, to put certain memory accesses on the consumer. And so in that case, we would leverage that annotation so that the consumer could just do these memory accesses and not have to wait for the producer. So uh, yeah, that's it. Um, let's thank the sheet.